it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to talk about climate, but it's not gotten better. So, Anthony, I, I have a few slides. Second. This okay. is probably going to be more than three minutes. Do we want to allow her to do more than three minutes? I would say yes. Is everyone else? I would say yes. Is everyone yeah, okay sure. with doing um, yeah. All right, so we're going to grant you more than three but minutes. Before we start, is yeah. there something happening with our Zoom that we yeah. need to? Is there something nice that happened? That we could expedite it, though. See, everything went blank. So okay, we're yeah. not recording and we're not. Um, so we're, we're not recording. Right are we? Right but we don't have your um, slide. Okay, well, you can talk through it. So I tried to keep it brief, and I will start even before the slides, which is to say that except for the dip during COVID, carbon emissions have increased. They continue to increase, and they're at a record high globally. So we're at a point where we're seeing enormous heat forcings from all the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, there are, we're now in our 13th month of record surface water heat and air temperatures. Ah, there we go. Do I have a thing to, okay, why don't you just progress? So that's the carbon emissions showing that it's rising. We had a little bit of a dip during the COVID period, but now it's back up and rising. You can go to the next one. This is what the climate scientists are looking at in terms of daily sea surface temperatures. The scientists themselves use the word gobsmacking. The, the February 3rd reading and the red line at the top is such a paradigm shift more than the historical um, temperatures recorded in all prior years. So 2023 is the orange line and 2016 is the yellow line and all other years are below that. So we are in scary temperature areas. And this is sort of a graphical presentation of, I'm sure you've seen these charts, but we're at this point of, we're not getting, we're not going back to normal anytime soon. So all of the historical information that the town has used, that we have used in terms of average rainfalls and amount of evaporation and numbers of droughts are gonna go off the chart soon. So we're really at this crux, this turning point in our climate. And I think that is sufficient motivation to to inform decisions that we might not want to invest, we might not have invested in 10 years ago that maybe we should be investing more into our water resources. Yeah. So we have <clears throat> flooding, we have droughts, we have a lot of um, extreme weather events that are costing us a lot. And go ahead. Um, ocean acidification being one, but this is just one of the more recent um, charts that I found relating to the fact that we are not alone here in California and sort of southwestern U.S. and southeastern U.S. that often have drought events. We are, this is happening globally. So that's my last slide. That's the, the extent of the presentation, but I, but I encourage you to think not as we used to think about dealing with water the way we did treating it as a nuisance and trying to just send it out to the bay, which is not even good for the bay, but to invest in um, more sustainable solutions. Thanks. I will be happy to take questions. Yes. Appreciate that. Yeah, nicely done. Thank you. Do you want to do two sentences about what you're, to summarize your letter, the key points of the letter you want us to? Um, to summarize the letter, we're at a juncture right now where we're about to invest in relining the channel. And this is just the right moment in time. It's 10 years kind of since I was last talking about this, but <clears throat> it's a time to, re to think differently about what we do with this water resource that can be a nuisance if we don't handle it right. And nobody wants flooding, but people do like to have um, healthy aquifers where their wells, you know, can access water, and they also like to have water to drink if 
for example, something happened to Hetch Hetchy. So my feeling is that if Atherton invested in certain storage resources or channeling to our existing reservoir or even just more filtering ponds it would be a good investment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, we have to approve item number seven, six. We have to approve item number six. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion to approve. Well, I, I'd like six. to make a comment before okay, we do that. Good idea. Um, when you made your comment, we did. I did talk about it with George, and I'm sure you talked to everybody about it. And one of the things that seems to me is I totally agree with what you're saying. But where the quandary is, is that we're at an, a risk factor for these people's houses. So, um, and my fear, if it is, um, if we delay. I would like to hear what these people say. And George pointed out that the people, the contract that we've hired are the same people who would be able to design and discuss solutions that are in the vein of preserving water and some of the arguments you're making. So my position was, why don't we ask them? So we start this project because it's based on urgency and life safety, but we add on to the contract that they ask them how much they would charge to add these new features and what would the new features be that they would recommend after they survey it. So somewhere after they've surveyed the whole thing, we got the map of the whole thing, they can give us their professional feedback on solutions that we might be able to add on to the contract. So that's where I would like to see it go. So I, I, I'm reluctant to just blanket this one and say we're done with it thanks for telling us we're done with it but i also don't want to hold it up because it involves safety so i want to find something in between so i guess what i'd like to talk about with my colleagues is is there somewhere in between and how do you feel about adding the ask to this contractor to say well what else can we do after you survey it what else can we do and give us a price for it we can always ask them later yeah. we don't yeah. have to do it as part of this contract that we've already gotten written up. We can always add another and do another budget amendment later if we so choose after we see what Tektra Tech comes up with. But I don't think that we should hold up this item at this point in time because um, we'd have to do a budget amendment, so. okay, until after we have some conversations with them. And so I think we should move ahead with approving this item as it stands, and and George can speak to them, as George and Robert can speak to them and see what they could come back with. So I, I agree with not I agree with you saying not to postpone it. I 100% agree yeah. with that. But when the contractor goes, I wouldn't also would not wait until they've done the work to tell them because when they go in and they're doing the survey, that's the time that they use their knowledge to see what they can do. So they can go into this contract as is, but what I'm suggesting is that we alter it to say, and we're also gonna at least alert them to the second piece of work that we'd like them to do. But Robert, Through the mayor, does it, yeah. can I, can yeah. I, sure. yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Widmer. Um, I agree with you, and I think that that is something that we could approve this with the instructions that um, we add onto this request um, what we're talking about, that they look at um, a, a broader view of just the, the channel as a holistic thing rather than just relining it. So I agree with you, and I think that we can make the motion with that addition. And I'm sorry, I, I do have to say, though, um, that if we are going to be modifying the scope of work beyond a small change order, we're gonna to have to put it out to bid again. So we we do have to be mindful about what kind of amendments we would potentially be making. So it's fine that the direction is that we may be making future amendments to it, but if we modify it such that we're making dramatic changes to the contract without going and rebidding it, then we're gonna be violating our competitive bid processes, so. Stacy, I had a George question. Has too. Okay, oh, go ahead. sorry, George. Let's just uh, go. We have two projects on the channel, and the one with the school has a water reservoir 
component it, to it. It's it tetra, has a detention system. A detention to, facility, yeah. which could potentially have it, recharge of it, the groundwater opportunities. Is Tetra involved? Um, I assume they're going we, to talk We to haven't. I so said right now we're still trying to get the funding right. ironed out for that. Once we have that funding ironed out, we will then put out a request for proposals for design services to get that moving. I would be surprised if Tetra Tech doesn't um, mm -hmm. submit a proposal for that, considering that they're going to be working right next to it. Um, that, that being said, we can have the conversation for them to have an open mind in terms of as they evaluate the channel. They are going to be coming back to us with potential solutions. Um, my, I mean, I say, but the footprint that we're allowed to do work in is defined. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a can that is likely going to be a constraint. Yep. Um, and so as they come back with that survey and we have more information, we're happy to share that with the council. Okay. So, I think George had a comment earlier. Oh, George did too. I'm sorry, George, you were next. Go ahead, and then right. Yeah. Yeah, sure, I did. Uh, thanks. Uh, one of the things Robert mentioned in his presentation was that the environmental agencies were going to push toward more sustainable solutions. Tetra Tech's got to be responding to those comments as part of the permitting process and the design process. So we can certainly bring back something that's considerate of that, um, that would might lend itself toward a more environmental solution. Awesome. Yeah, that's exactly what I think we should do. Yeah, um, so I have I, I have three different comments. Um, the first is is very much in line with what George just said, and I think totally consistent with what a city attorney said, which is in the course of doing this review, Tetra Tech isn't just going to be coming telling us we need to line the channel. They're they're going to be doing a whole analysis. For example, there's the whole issue that we had with where that culvert is, where we did the frog protection, and they're going to run into different things. I think in the course of that, we should we should inform them that we have a particular interest in softer, more sustainable solutions. So the, as part of the project, that would be uh, just part of this project, and that's not a big change order. I, I don't think it's a change order. I think it's just uh, a focus. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Secondly... I think that the, in the course of doing that, they, in order for water to really seep into the aquifer, it needs to stand, right? It just can't be running all the time. And um, the only place that the town has land that I'm aware of where that water might stand is at the park. Um, the, the school has water where has land where the water could stand, as does the circus club. But uh, the only place that the town does, I think, is at the park. Uh, but I think that and, and, I, and there may well be private properties where that could happen, where those property owners may be interested in doing something with us as we upgrade the channel to make it safer, uh, where um uh, where there may need to be some kind of a change order that would enable water to go onto that property and stand. That would probably be more of a change order along the lines of what the city attorney mentioned. Uh, but I, I would think that Tetra Tech could look for those opportunities in the course of this. And if they see some private properties, they can list those. And then we can engage with staff and figure out what we want to do if we want to contact those private properties about the possibility, because there may be some property owners that actually want to work with the town and, and, and like maybe where you saw there was flooding mm -hmm. up on in yeah. the Valley road areas right, where exactly. I think it was, uh, they may be interested in that and, and we could work with them and help create some solutions when there's significant rain that in fact, we will be in, yeah. intentionally impregnating the aquifer. So I think we could ask Tetra Tech to look for those opportunities and list them in the course of doing this, and then we can decide what to do with it. Okay, third that's my second comment. Third comment. 
I think that the worst decision that this council ever made in the 11 years that I've been on it was the decision not to do the water treatment facility in the park. Now, that water treatment facility in and of itself wouldn't have done anything about putting water into the aquifer, but it would have created an opportunity where we could have, and it would have cleaned the water as uh, state agencies are requiring us to do. And, and I feel badly for the council and self-critical personally that we didn't make that happen. And it would have been and paid would, for by the, by the state. It, and it would have been paid for by the state, and maybe with a change of heart, the state would reconsider. But this does bring up the issue of our entire sort of aquifer and the water uh, issue. And I would like to uh, have us as a council uh, engage with staff on the possibility of thinking about what we might want to do. And, and I, I, I think Bill's comment is totally appropriate. We, we want state funding, so we sort of have to go hat in hand. But uh, but I th this brings up that issue for me. So that's my third comment. I totally agree. Yeah, exactly. There okay. were competing interests. Uh, I, so I'd time. like to make a motion then that uh, we approve this moving forward uh, with the proviso that there would be some discussion between Robert and Tetra Tech about them coming back in the areas where they see uh, possibility for some soft spots and also communicate with the neighbors as they're doing their surveys and see if there's any areas where we could possibly expand to have a, a, a water collection pond, so to speak. Um, and then I agree with Rick that we should, at a future date, look at something else in the park. But so is there a second on my second? Motion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. That's okay. And, <clears throat> and tell them how the limit, the time yeah. limit. Is it the three minute limit? No, it's one minute for not on the agenda. One minute. You're the one who made that Sorry, happen. <laughs> you made the thing. Yeah. Oh, I'll just make this real quick. I heard something in the a friend was telling me that. Uh, they were coming down, uh, one of your tenants in here in the city was upset because he found out that condos were going to be being built near his home here in Atherton. I said, well, if he can afford to live in Atherton, anybody that's scouting for him a piece of property should go to the city and have responsibility to come to the city and see what's being built around it. It's not for the city to tell him. It's for him, if he can afford to live here, to have his realtor find out what's going on around him in the future and not hold the city responsible. So I'm on, so I'm back in the city. And I just wanted to, a real fast comment on the lady about water here, because um, I do that a lot and I've been going to Sacramento and a lot of city council meetings, I do that. I even went to Bosqua. I was gonna get them a case of Hetch Hetchy water when Newsom was in office. And that was a dollar a bottle, it was straight from Hetch Hetchy. Hetch Hetchy, but they stopped it because he found out his um, overhead was too low. And it was a dollar a bottle, $24 a case. And Willie Brown, when he was in office, he made a certain section of the Hetch Hetchy when it was built to bottle water for that. It's up there at Hetch Hetchy. And then when Newsom left the city, he um, signed that bill. No, I should have said when Brown he was, Governor Brown, I'm trying to remember all this. Governor Brown, before he left, he signed a bill that said, if you have a crematory in your city, in California, you can liquefy bodies and pour it down the drain and send it to the water treatment plant. Women in green. And so that's happening. It's happening. Ted Bush, Ted Bush did it in Florida and other states are doing it. If it a, they say it's going green. Instead of burning bodies, they liquefy it with um, it. hair straightener or something, and they pour it down the drain, it goes to a water treatment plant, and they allegedly filter it out, and you don't take it. They don't taste it or smell it because of the ammonia they put in there. They kill the smell, and the chlorine, the 
knock down the germ, should we say, and that's a lot of chloramine. And chloramine, as we know, rottens your pipes. And your city is as old as mine. I'm from East Palo Alto. Your city is as old as mine. You might have to start replacing your pipes in your city because the chloramine does rotten the pipes. And I just wanted to tell you that, share that with you. That's all. And I agree with you. Treat your water and put filters on all the schools. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good point. I'm not kidding. Look what that is. Can I make a note? I just noticed something. We approve items one through five, and we have seven items on our consent. No, I did. I did one seven. through five plus seven. seven. Oh, plus seven. Yeah. 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 All right, so we're going to move to the regular agenda. Um, item number eight, consider acceptance of loan sculpture entitled celebration, and if appropriate, direct the city manager and city attorney to finalize the terms of acceptance. And George, are you going to talk about this? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. So it's recommended that the council consider acceptance of the loan sculpture entitled Celebration. I know you have Valerie Gardner here in the audience who can speak more to the specific art piece. The staff report, I'll be very brief, uh, has the terms for the loan of the garden sculpture, of the sculpture, uh, and it consists of one through eight or so. Uh, and the proposed location is uh, between Ashfield Road entry point into the town center and the historic town center is the proposed spot. The cost of uh, installation is likely de minimis. It's a concrete pad and other minor details there. Insurance, we'd have to insure it. That's usually one to two percent of the sculpture value, which would be about five thousand uh, dollars. And then the cost of transportation, which Valerie may be able to speak to since she's may have had to move that in the past. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to the council to ask any questions of Valerie, who's in the audience. Yeah, actually, I I will start. Um, how much? I, one of the questions I had is, what are the costs for us? So, he said that the the slab that it's on is de minimis. How much is transportation and installation? You've done that before, and can yeah, you give us a it's not very much. Like, are we talking thousands or? It's probably a thousand dollars to move it, and. I'm not sure what the concrete base would be. It should be on a pedestal that will need to have, you know, a form and concrete poured. Um, but, you know, using union, whatever labor could be more than what I paid in the past, but it was, a, I think, 3000 when I did it the first time. That was a long time ago. Do you have any ideas what it would be to make? Because we just put in the, the froggy over there. Well, the frog, I think, is a bit more ornate in terms of what it what it was. I think a closer representation is likely the sculpture that was put into the park. Um, I'm not quite sure how large this one is, but I think the foundation and installation on that one was maybe about 5,000 or so, but costs have gone up since then. That would be a one-time cost. So five thousand a year for insurance. For insurance. Correct. And we're keeping it for a minimum of ten years. Is what the contract says. Mm -hmm. So it's fifty-five thousand dollars over ten years. No. At no cost. So I don't have any questions. Do you have a question, Rick? The I do have a question. So I'm, I'm just looking over the terms. I, I don't have any problem with the 10 year loan arrangement. I, mm -hmm. I think that's reasonable. Um, uh, and it's renewable. And it, it's not clear if it's renewable for one or more than one term. I, I think we should be clear about what the renewability is. Uh, point number six said Additionally, the town will have the right to return the sculpture after five years for any reason. Um, and the family can claim the sculpture after five years, which makes it look like a five-year loan, not a 10-year loan. So that seems odd to me. That's kind of in conflict. Uh, I don't have any other issue with it. Everything else looks pretty reasonable to me. I actually think to put the frog in was more than five thousand dollars. They they had some expenses related to that that 
Um, I don't well, the, think we would have the, with this. Like I said, the frog is quite a bit different. It's on a raised pedestal as opposed to flat on near the ground level. Plus they have, they wanted it to be more interactive where they have the pathway for um, access to go all the way around it. And so if this is set into the landscaping and almost at ground level, the installation costs will be a lot less than the frog. In yeah, the, one more comment. The only thing I think, which I think would we would do with anything that, that we wanna make sure of is we don't want kids climbing on it. And if you recall, we, we had a problem in the park with the fountain that got damaged because kids climbed on it. So I'm not sure that this is something that would um, invite that. Uh, I don't know that there's anything we have to do about that initially, but I think we have to watch it. And if we see that there's kids climbing on it, we gotta do something. So I, I could respond to that. I think the landscaping surrounding it, this is an existing condition, the picture uh, is where it's currently uh, displayed and it looks like uh, carpet roses all around it. So, I mean, if you put uh, this kind of landscaping around it, kids aren't gonna be traipsing through the carpet roses to get to the sculpture. Uh, and yet you still see the entire sculpture. Are we um, doing comments? Because well, I have a in, in yeah. the in the picture that we have here, it's sitting on a round base. Is yes. that the base that we'd be replicating, or does that base come with it, and we're doing a base underneath? <clears throat> that base might be available. I'm not sure, but it's just a concrete form. Um, if if it's movable, I can investigate that. But I think it could be on a round or a rectangular base. So it's not- Rectangular base would be less expensive. I, I think the picture that you're looking at is the Photoshop kind of- um, Installation. Uh, the, the, the this is the installation on San Antonio Road, I think. Oh, okay. If it's the installation on San Antonio Road, then that is where it, it was installed. It's been moved from there, but that base may be available and it could be moved potentially I, I, and- I think that's. I think it's a small amount of money to uh, invest into um, a piece of art that's being not quite donated, but on a long-term loan. And I guess the question would be, you know, what circumstances would you do foresee where you might want to take it back within that first five-year period uh, after after we've um, you know invested, you know, the transportation, the installation, and the soul and it uh so you know uh, or would you feel good that it's here for a long time i mean do you see it uh wanting to i do feel good about it being here. here the the primary driver for this sculpture was to be available for public view to have the public have access to it and that circumstance changed where it was which is why it's being moved and so the idea of moving it into private collection is not a primary objective. It, the, the real reason for the long-term loan rather than donation is just because I would rather my children make this decision as to where it goes finally. And what's your age right now? <laughs> <laughs> why did the, what happened with the school? Why did they not, want, why did they have to get rid of it? Well, they didn't get rid of it. They, it was installed on in the front of the school as a marker for the entrance to the school, but then they decided to move it inside, which what violated the terms that my father had agreed to. And that wasn't where we wanted it, behind a closed wall. So, so I think that um, we should approve this, I, I, I think it's absolutely going to be in public display. So it's going to satisfy the requirements of the family. I think that it should be a 10-year loan. And if uh, the family wants to make it five years after the first 10 years, that's fine. But I think that we, there should be a 10-year period where we know it's going to be here. Um, it's fine. I can agree to that. Okay. Um, and, and I think that if... I think staff can look at the, uh, with with Valerie can look at the base that it's on right now and make a judgment as to whether it makes more sense 
to move that if it's movable or to have it built ourselves and we can just leave that to staff yeah uh bill yeah uh, well, where do we get the five thousand dollars a year uh insurance cost that's uh the estimated value based on insurance questions to the jpa and what we think the estimated value was two hundred and fifty thousand. One to two percent is this a, a numbered piece? Are there more than one of these? And which number is It's this? a one of a kind. It's a one of a kind. There is a <clears throat> one third scale replica that was de designed and produced as a demonstration of what the final sculpture would be in the course of the commission of this piece for the school many years ago. So that is a one third replica, but only one made it seven feet tall. Stacy, do you have a comment? I had a question about how durable it is with kids climbing on it, because I've brought packs of children who play hide and go seek and they crawl around in the in front of the library. So I mean, we could put landscaping around it, but chances are kids are gonna climb on it. Is won't it won't hurt it a bit. Okay. Great. We tried to drill. There was a three holes in the base, stainless steel, quarter inch base. We tried to drill a like quarter inch hole for the bolt to be like five eighths. And then we went through 13 diamond tipped drill bit heads to, okay. to get those holes to be tiny, tiny bit wider. So it is so difficult. This material is so strong, nothing can hurt it. Kids will not hurt it. Kids could hurt themselves, but they can't hurt it. Um, I'll take, make my comment. I love the piece. Um, I want us to be mindful of where we put it because it is a shiny steel and all of the color palettes of our building, the antique buildings, like if in the, some of the pictures that have it in front of the building, you'll notice the frog is a patina that's closer to the colors of the thing. Mm -hmm. So this is different. I love it. I think it's joyful and I really like it, but I want us to be mindful where we put it and where, when you look at it, where what's behind it is what I'm saying. And I also would like to have you share with us the history of how it was made, where it was fabricated and all that. So we can write some article about it. And let Not now, but learn. like in, in materials. Yeah, in the future, yeah. Right. Yeah. So part of my proposal was to work out specific terms, you know, that we could sign on an official art loan agreement so we can do that as part of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, the the photoshopped image that george had previously sent around like right to us here. what it's right here yeah right there that's in the planning material right over there mm -hmm. and i thought it looked great I, I thought that location looked really good and it's very it's, it's, public it's so it it's absolutely of, would satisfy the, the desires of the family I just, um, I think that the the style of it has a, a freedom feeling. It uh, feels joyous to me. Um, I haven't seen it in person, but um, the three people holding hands and just it just feels happy. And um, I, um, I think because it is made out of stainless steel, um, they that's just what you get with that. And so the patina does not um, clash for me. My, my eye does not find it uh, offensive for this uh, environment. So um, <clears throat> personally, I'd rather see this in the park. Not that I don't think it fits here, but I think it fits even better in the park. If it was in the park, we could probably ask the foundation to pay for it. Um, perhaps we could contact the, the park foundation and see if they'd be willing to consider covering this into a little piece of the town park. Um, so I think we should investigate that. Um, I'm a little... You know, it's, it's an un, uh, unbudgeted amount of money for the insurance. I think the insurance is a little over the top, um, but 
Uh, if George has investigated it, then that's fine. Um, it is a nice piece. I'm sure it would add value. I agree with others that said uh, kids will probably jump on it, and hopefully um, uh, it won't get damaged, nor will kids get hurt. So, um, you know, maybe we need to put a little bit more around it, like we did with the uh, with the frog. Um, but I can go along with it, but I, I, I just think the $5,000 a year is a tad bit high, and hopefully we can work with our insurer to bring that down to something like a thousand or two thousand dollars a year, and we can check with the Park Foundation. I'll talk to Frank if if everybody would like me to. How do you feel oh. about having it in the park? Would that be something that would be considered? I'd be open to that. You would be open. public okay. as long as it's a public location okay. and it's prominent right. in some way. Yeah, right. and I believe you had in there that you're gonna finalize with us where it goes, right? Right. Good. I expect so it to be, be you know, kind of agreeable on both sides. Okay, great. Fantastic. All right, so then so, I'll talk to but, Frank. Well, but back. wait, hold on a second. I don't think we've decided that. Well, no, it was just okay. an option. Yeah, so you made your um, personal opinion. I think that it really could add some something here. You know, we have a lot of landscaping, a lot of wild, natural landscaping. And we have the frog, which I think is um, whimsical. <laughs> and it is bronze. It is, you know, a dark color. But I think, you know, I, I like the feeling that it's here. I think Valerie chose it to be here because of the intimacy that, you know, it would um, bring uh, to it. Uh, I just, I don't know. Um, that's my personal opinion. I understand your personal opinion, Mr. Widmer, that you would like to put it in the park somewhere. I feel that um, while it would be on public display, I think the chances of it um, being damaged or you know having other things bad happen to it at the park is uh, greater. Well, I'm more interested in finding the money for it. I don't think the $5,000 a year is that big of a deal. But if you get somebody to pay for it, out of a different fund. I think Maybe that we that can get plus. the library no. to uh, fund it. Well, I think that, that would be a good idea. Okay, too. I think that's a good idea. I think we should ask the library. So I, I think, do we take a motion on this? George? George. Sure. Is he shaking um, his head? So I would like at least some clarity with respect to whether the council would prefer it in the park or prefer it in the town center before we sit down with Valerie and talk about some more details, finalizing an agreement. So that would probably require some consensus or emotion. With respect to use of library funds, um, this is on the library side of the town parcel. So from my perspective, using the town's share of the library funds or at least a portion thereof is probably fine. Yeah, okay. And, and, and uh, this is library funds that we, you know, the, what used to be called donor funds that, that George proposes each year. So that's very easy to do. And I don't think that would be workable if it wasn't on the library side of the parcel. But given that it, that the Photoshop image is right over there in front of the historic town hall, which is part of the library now, I think it's fine. And I, I think that would be appropriate. And, I like it here. We we only have one other art piece here, right. which is the frog. Mm -hmm. They have the little which, pond too. That yeah, the but, kids we, play in but all, we have, well, we have we have talk some talk about a dangerous we situation have some we have there. I mean, the the, but, the little fountain pond is yeah. very dangerous. I, I'd like another art piece. This feels. Mm -hmm. I, I I think that it would show extremely well here. All right, I vote that do we. All right, I recommend. I'm going to make a motion. I was just doing that. No, you can't do that. Well, I can do it. I'd no, like I'm going to make the motion <laughs> that, that we accept the donation and make sure it goes by the library. I'll second that. Great. Mr. Widmer, you're a piece of work. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank I you. I would Valerie. say if we're putting it on the library side and if the statue is this durable then maybe we do want a piece of art that's called celebration to be accessible for kids to touch might be a cool way 
to honor well, its history. Won't hurt it at all. They won't so, hurt it at all. You know. So, okay. It's all good. Thank you, Thanks. Valerie. Thank you for thinking of us. Thank you. He's very generous. Okay. Okay. Um, item nine. Interim update pickleball pilot at Holbrook Palmer Park. Steve and okay. uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, give me a second here and I'm gonna try and uh, share my screen. Um, as uh, the council is uh, aware, you approved uh, the uh, establishment of a pilot pickleball program at uh, Holbrook Palmer Park. Um, and so the striping of the cord, the, the purchase of temporary nets, et cetera, happened in uh, January of this year. And so pickleball has been open uh, since the latter part of January um, for residents and key holders to use. Um, weather had a great impact on um, usage of tennis and pickleball uh, during our extended um, extended winter, but um, we are seeing a significant uptick in um, in usage at the um, at the park, and so um, we progressed from eight hours for the short period of time in January. Um, almost doubling every month, but we're, we're right now at, um, for June, it was tracked at about 124 hours of um, pickleball usage on the two courts that were um, overlaid on um, court one. And so as you recall, pickleball hours are limited to um, the morning hours, seven days a week and two evenings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, at the time that we um, prepared the report, there were 83 respondents to the survey. Um, there was uh, an email blast that went out subsequent uh, to us starting to draft this. And so right now we actually have 143 respondents. And so we're glad to see the uptick in um, participation on the survey. Survey is open through the end of the month. Okay, um, and so I'm just going to hit a few highlights. Um, we have um, about 63% of the respondents, 90 respondents are Atherton residents. Um, and most folks that participated in the survey were aware of the, the trial. Um, we asked the respondents to tell us when, uh, whether or not they use the courts and if so, for what. Um, the, the greater majority of respondents are uh, court users, um, and it's actually pretty closely split between folks that use tenant, use it for tennis and pickleball, which is a little different than what you had attached to the staff report. Um, and the respondents to the survey, about almost 60% of the respondents are, are key holders. Um, and we did ask the question as to whether or not they purchased the key specifically <laughs> to participate in the trial. And there are 39 respondents that said yes, which is actually quite a, a good number. Um, last year, as noted in your report, I think we sold a total of 99 keys. And to date, we're at 135. And so initiating this program has um, encouraged folks to take a look at the courts. And um, we did ask the question as to how easier, do people find it easy or difficult to make reservations on the court? Um, and most folks are saying it's easy. Others responded with um, some level of difficulty, some related to um, not being familiar with the system and how to do it and needing help etc. Others with regards to the availability of usage of courts, uh, whether that is general usage, um, use by um, inst for instruction and for camps, and then the additional overlay of pickleball. Um, and then we asked questions about how often they use the courts. Um, 
And so this is just to help us digest things. We also asked for preferred times of playing pickleball. And it's the mostly in the morning, both weekend and weekday, which is when we're open. Um, about half the respondents are also saying on the in the evenings. But um, the afternoons, probably because of heat or whatever, it's got a little bit of a lower um, lower preference. And we asked generally, you know, what are your thoughts? You know, are you are you thinking that um, uh, our the temporary trial um, generally positive, negative, any comments that they have, et cetera? And so almost 70% are, have a generally positive feeling about the pickleball trial. Um, then we asked, cause we, as part of the approval, yes, let's put some uh, baffling material up and um, more than half the folks feel that the baffling has made a difference or is beneficial. Um, other, there's uh, almost a third that says it's, that you really can't tell a difference. And then you have a group of folks that says pickleball is too loud. Um, and then we had an, uh, a question, you know, we have um, a system right now for tennis as well as for pickleball where, you know, you go online, you make a reservation for court use. Um, and then if uh, you're at the park and the courts are not used and you're a key holder, you can go in and, and use the court. So we asked folks, should we require reservations for pickleball usage? And about 40% or more than 40% said yes. Um, another 30% or so said um, mostly a reservation, but maybe some drop-in periods. Um, and then we asked the question, if we had drop-in periods, when, if we had fixed drop-in periods, when should they be? Um, and then this is one where we said, okay, well, this is a trial. Should we consider permanent facilities? And about a little more than 70% are saying yes. Uh, a little more than 20% are saying no. Um, and then we asked a question about, well, where, if we do put permanent courts in, where should they be? Um, and then I'm going to say, if you look at the total, 40 per, little, about 45% are saying not next to the tennis courts, um, someplace separate. Um, and then the remainder are whether continue to joint use of the tennis court or fully converting one of the courts. Um, these are just high, high level highlights. Um, the details are going to be looked at by a subcommittee from the Park and Rec Committee and then by the full committee um, digesting the information and they'll be dissecting it from a few different angles. We can, for example, filter the results to tell us, okay, this is everybody. What about Atherton residents? Um, what about um, folks that only play tennis, for example. So we can filter some of the results to kind of get a little more granular on, on the information. Um, and so that'll be looked at by the subcommittee in, um, in August, and then hopefully to the full committee in um, September. And then we hope to come back to you with the final results of the survey at your September meeting. So this is open until the end of the month, right? It is open until the end of the month. That's correct. Then will you close it? Yes. It's been open for a couple of months. Well, that, that, I'm going to say by closing, we have survey? kind of a, right. um, what do you call it? A, a certain period of time where we've collected the information. I think we had the survey start up in um, mid-June. And so we're oh, about a month and a half or so. It'll be will have been open. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were saying the survey. I thought you were saying you're gonna close pickleball down. No, no, the just the survey. survey. Oh, the survey, okay, uh, good. So, change it, right. any yes, changes. that's what I was responding to yesterday. So right now it's a pickleball trial. Yeah. Any changes to the pickleball, we'd be coming to you for direction. Do you want us to continue it the way it is until we figure something out? Do you wanna stop it? Do you wanna reconvert the court? That's a decision that'll come before the council after the after um, 
the survey period is complete and uh, we have feedback from the Park and Rec Committee. Yes. Does anyone have any questions? I have one when it comes back and we have numbers attached to the scenario. So when people are saying, like, I'd be curious if we keep it on the existing tennis court. So now you're not versus taking in and putting somewhere else where you have to now put in the ground and do all that. Can we have numbers attached so that we don't, we know what we're choosing? We have some numbers from when we came up with this pilot program. Uh, the leave it as it is in terms of shared court, it's no cost. Um, reconverting the court to tennis and getting rid of the striping, I think we had a cost of about 10,000. And then the same thing, if you were going to surface it and do permanent striping for pickleball would be somewhere around that amount. But then you also have if we're doing permanent nets and that kind of thing, it'll be a little more expensive. But if you're talking about building a whole new court, that is something that would require a lot more effort. And it's really going to be dictated on where and what and how it looks like and how people would access it. And so there are certain things that we can give you ballpark numbers on. But then if you're looking at a whole new court someplace, yeah, where oh, that then handball it's a different... wall is, remember that wall? The, uh, way back when we talked yeah. about this before, that idea surfaced of putting it over there. And, and it's still an option. And so what I think that we will do is we, we'd be getting direction from you as to things to investigate after you have that feedback. Fantastic. I have a question. <clears throat> um, on your uh, chart, uh, it's actually page three of 31 in your report or page 351 of 391? It's question three. <clears throat> Do you use the courts at Holbrook Palmer Park for tennis, pickleball, both, whatever? Obviously, the people who are responding to this survey are pickleball players. They're no, that, that's where I said we asked, you know, how do you, how do you use them? And yeah. so the current response is, like I said, we have a total of 143 respondents at this point in time. And I'm going to just scroll back up to um, how people responded currently. And so we that? have 55 people right now that responded that they use the courts for tennis. Here, I'll share the screen again. Hold on a second. The, this is, these numbers are from 80. So these numbers are from the 83. Yeah, and so, so we have a bunch and more players have responded. responses. I know they sent out hold on. player capital yeah. sent out. Uh, oh, it yeah. went out to all the people with keys, so all yeah. the tennis players got okay. the survey. So too. on your screen, you'll yeah. see in yeah, front of you rich. that right now we have 55 respondents that said that they use the courts the for tennis. 53 respondents that use it for pickleball. 17 respondents that do both. See. Um, and then um, here I'll try and zoom in and make it a little bit bigger is that better mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then you have you know there are folks that just visit the park and then there are folks that are neighbors and so we have um, 14 folks that are just general park users and don't necessarily use the courts and then we have four folks that responded as as neighbors and so in terms of respondents pickleball versus tennis Right now, with the results that we have today, it's pretty even. Can we see what the answer is for the next one of, are you a current key holder? I'm just wondering, like, we know there's, what, 135 key holders? So it's a good amount of the key holders have responded. Yeah. And a 70% response rate is a really high response rate. I mean, that number of, of, What's that? Of, of the people who said that it, they thought it was a good idea was like 70%. That's really high. 70%. Are you talking about generally positive? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. Know, out of what amount of pool, you know, what pool of people, certainly not tennis players. Well, it was sent out to all residents. It, so that doesn't are, mean that, some, that some, you know. Well, so I'm going to say that. that um, if you want. The one thing I will add is, like I said, we had the, the information that's in your staff report. Uh -huh. um, as the staff report was being developed, player capital actually 
sent it out. Sent there. out an email encouraging users to respond to the survey. Yeah. yeah. And so there was an uptick in responses. That's how we went from 83 to 143. So we got about 60 more responses since that time. But we time. don't have them integrated into this. It is. It's on the that's screen. what this answer, that's what I'm showing you on the screen today. Not in the report, but on the screen. Okay. So we'll get an update. And you'll get a full update, um, you know, when we uh, close out the survey. Yes, this good. information is also going to be shared with the Pickleball Subcommittee. And they're going to dive into the free response comments as well. Okay. So this yes. question, do you find it easy or difficult to make a reservation for court use, tennis or pickleball? It, it, the the feasibility of making, I mean, the system and making a reservation uh -huh. is the same. It's the same system. It's not any different. Right. And there is a free response section where folks made comments as to why they find it easy or difficult. Hmm. Um, and the responses vary, as I mentioned earlier, from... A lot of the courts are used for clinics and things, mm. or the addition of pickleball has made it more difficult to make a reservation. So there's 40 comments that folks filled in as to why, and I didn't, I didn't really want to dive too much into the details in, in this meeting, but I'll, I'll just kind of click it and see if we can open it. Um, here we go. Uh, limited court space. Um, the It's open for a week before it gets pulled off or player capital isn't always abided. This person is saying isn't always abided by. Um, many late afternoons are reserved either by player capital or pickleball, leaving only a limited court for... Um, a resident for um, for folks in this one here, just fewer tennis courts, probably because of the pickleball. Hardly any courts are available. Um, yeah, yeah, and Robert on on the reservation. So most most of the data comes from the reservation systems, including player capital reserves that what they yeah. think uh -huh. is going to be it. I walk through the park all the time coming here and, and a lot of times stuff like open. that. And there's nobody on the courts or they're just using two courts, but they reserve four or five. And so there's got to be, you know, a little bit of understanding. And I, you know, I brought up before, it'd be greater, better if we would actually get, when they check in that there's, it gets verified and we know exactly who's using the courts and when. And player capital should be asked to release the courts 48 hours in advance if they don't have a reservation for somebody coming in. Because it's just, it's not fair. I understand some, I've heard from, from people too say, I, I can't get a reservation. Yeah. And I said, well, when did you want to play? They tell me, and I said, well, I was a, nobody was on the court. Or they were only using two courts. Yeah. And so it's, it's not right. What we've got that, that that part of our system needs to be updated. Are you using uh, an AI app here to do the sentiment analysis, or how will we analyze those? One more time. Oh, that's uh, just one of their features. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm... <laughs> so it's through Survey Monkey. Will and they will they'll do the open ended responses for us. They'll do what? I was asking if we have a method for summarizing the open-ended writing oh, responses. That, the the two way, I'm going to say that called. the, the yeah. subcommittee is going to review all okay. of the responses. Fantastic. Nice report. Thank yes, you. Thank you much. for doing that. Comment on that Maybe item. George is. <laughs> I lost Georgia. Yeah. Right, we, we lost everything. Okay Let's, move on. On. Let's move on. Okay. So. Uh, item 10, bicycle and pedestrian master plan update request for proposals. And this is Robert again. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. 
Um, I think uh, there, there's a little bit of history on, on this. As you are aware, um, our original bicycle and pedestrian master plan was adopted in 2014. So it's 10 years old. We've uh, done a variety of improvements, um, accomplishing some of the goals and objectives within the bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Um, an update is needed to reflect those and um, help us reprioritize um, uh, the projects that were identified and the projects that our residents might be interested in. And then um, last year, there was a um, San Mateo County Civil Grand Jury report that um, had a recommendation that all 21 jurisdictions within the county update or create reports if their reports or if their uh, master plans are more than five years old. Mm -hmm. And so we agreed that we would do that. Um, the bicycle pedestrian master plan update is uh, was approved in the capital budget. And so we're ready to release the request for proposals and uh, bringing it forward for you tonight for any uh, comments and feedback before we release it. Any comments, questions? I mean, I have a no? comment. All right. Any other? Any questions? No questions. All right. Comment. Want to take public comment? Any public comments on this item? No. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I have two comments on this. <clears throat> One is the staff report talks about updating the 2014 master plan. I I, I would rather us talk about revising. <laughs> the 2014 master plan. I, I, and I, I think it's timely and really good that we're doing this. So I, I think that's a minor change. And I have a couple of language changes, if the council would agree with that, that we sort of focus it as a revision rather than an update. And the reason I think that's appropriate is that the 2014 master plan was approved at a time that we were actually putting in place, I think five, four or five master plans. So if you recall, uh, for those of us that were on the council, when we did this, there were a whole, there were a, we were doing the park plan at the same time, we were doing the town center plan at the same time, and we were doing the drainage plan at the same time. So I think there were some things that were included in different master plans that were sort of strongly advocated by the committees that were driving those master plans. Uh, and um, and I don't think we reviewed them as carefully as we have the opportunity to do now because we're just focusing on one master plan. And that kind of has been highlighted for me in the course of the two issues in the last year about class two bike lanes on both Af Atherton Avenue, which we kind of slightly dealt with, and the, the currently proposed project on Selby Lane, which were absolutely in the master plan. But I don't think when they when that, that master plan was approved that this council ever really went into an in-depth review of what the implications of those changes might be. And I'm not saying those changes aren't right. I'm just saying I don't think we went into the assessment of what the implications would be. And I think we have that opportunity now. So I think to look at this as a revision rather than just an update is the right way to look at it. That That's one comment. The second comment is, um, uh, the the staff report says that the consultant that's hired will do a whole variety of things. It's listed on pages 374 and 75, including attend uh, the Atherton Transportation, Bicycle, and Pedestrian Safety Committee meetings and incorporate their input into the plan, which I think is appropriate. But I also think that it's appropriate if there's projects that are proposed in the plan that there needs to be a community meeting in the neighborhood where those projects are proposed. So, and um, you know that gives residents a more focused opportunity to engage on the issues that are gonna directly impact them. That doesn't mean that the residents are going to get engaged because we know from our experience that it's very hard to get residents engaged until they feel right. threatened in some way. but. But I think that the consultant should should organize meetings in, in each of those neighborhoods where projects are proposed 
because I think that will give more of an opportunity for the residents to get engaged than if they have to come to either the bike, uh, the transportation, bicycle and pedestrian committee or to one of our meetings. Well, um, if I could make a comment on that, I think that we need to have a townwide meeting on it, but there, there's a lot of things that are proposed in the long-term plan that are in multiple jurisdictions, not just Atherton Ave and Selby Lane, that we would the cost of this study would be astronomical because they would be coming here and going to all the different neighborhoods. So I think uh, just like we've done for housing, which covered lots of different neighborhoods, and what we've done in other areas, uh, I think that we should have you know, one town-wide meeting where people would get an invitation to come and, and have their input. If you want to have two meetings where they would go back and update and then come back again, that's fine. But going to many different neighborhoods, and I can't tell you how many would want to have that, but there's it, more than just two, I would think. So I'd rather just see it be something here like we've done for the housing and like we've done for, you know, uh, for the building uh, descriptions and things like that, setbacks, et cetera. We've had several meetings here um, in addition to planning and council meetings. So I think it should be here. That's my two cents. Yeah. Okay. We're going to comments instead of just questions, but my comment would be that I think the, uh, however we choose to orchestrate it and roll it out, I think the uh, idea that was raised by Councilmember DeGoya to you know reach out to the residents who will be impacted on about these projects early on to let them kind of know what's coming down the road uh, or something like that, whether it's in that immediate neighborhood or in a school close to them or in a big town-wide gathering with you know big tables in, in sections and stuff i mean just the idea is that we really need and i think that has been shown to us uh, recently uh, that residents and they always kind of feel blindsided because even though we have these public outreach meetings and typically it's it's if we have a big big town-wide meeting, they don't, it doesn't penetrate their consciousness. But if it's in their neighborhood, they, the neighbors talk and say, well, we're going to meet at so-and-so's house and you got to come and hear this. So, you know, you, it's just something that you have to weigh um, at the time. Yeah, I think we learned a lot from the Selby Lane neighborhood meeting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the question, I guess a question slash comment I have is what came out of that was a resident who wrote a letter who pointed out that the Selby Lane School is now the Alante School and that the commuter patterns have significantly changed since our last thing because before there was a significant number of kids coming down Selby Lane on bikes and on foot to go to the school and this resident claimed that since they've switched over to be the other school the traffic patterns have become more of a commuter school like some of our, our other schools where people drive and drop and if that that's a pretty significant difference in how that street's being used and how the traffic pattern is. And I'm wondering, Robert, if our study, and I know you're in the study, it talked about doing uh, actual sit, they're gonna sit and count how many bikes and stuff there are, but will it pick up things like the change in the Elante school and the, the, the commuter patterns? I mean, how do we study that and how do we make sure we catch that? So we got that came to us from okay. the neighborhood. Well, that the school so, changed the, from being like a um, uh, elementary and middle school uh, to only count, being to count. grade five. So, so also five the old. commuter patterns yeah. changed. The, the, well, the, the pedestrian patterns changed. There's more people that drive and drop now. Because the children don't, they're too young. Well, it's also, yeah. they come yeah. from different areas too. Exactly. Wants to answer yeah. it. Yes, I know. Okay. That she was still so um, to answer your question, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the objectives that we've outlined. Um, and so the first one really is, like, like I said, update our data sets in terms of um, the the traffic, bicycle, and I, I just noticed I'm missing the word pedestrian counts on major routes and um, collector streets, okay? When we collect that data, 
it'll be a snap, more or less a snapshot in time. We can't judge what future changes are going to happen in terms of land use, school use, et cetera. Um, we will have the data to help us analyze um, and determine what needs are. The second is to engage with the community. This is the entire town to help us um, define needs and priorities. Based on those needs and priorities, we're going to look at developing conceptual designs for um, major routes with input from residents and community stakeholders. And so we will likely have to define a number, meaning that I can't, it, if there's going to be a question, well, how many, because how many means how much time they're going to put towards it. Um, and the way that I envision it is we'll define a number and it'll probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of five. Okay. Um, and so with that, I would say they would develop the concepts. We would reach out to the folks on those routes and townwide and likely have a community meeting here where we can host a number of folks with exhibits and things where folks can comment, they can provide us feedback, they can give us their contact information. We're happy to engage with them more closely on their concerns. Um, help us update and amend the current goals, policies, and things that we as a town have as set standards. Um, following the best practices and guidelines from CCAG, MTC, Caltrans, and others on best practices for these kinds of routes. Um, we have a grant, so we have requirements for the grant that we have to meet. Um, and then, you know, as we collect this and we develop these things, um, we're going to develop, um, identify and improve upon uh, the connected network that we have, tying into the stuff that we currently have, stuff that our neighboring jurisdictions are working on and implementing, and then things that we have in our planning stages as well. Um, describing the facilities, having cross sections, help us pick priorities. Um, and then I think what I'm hearing is basically adding a couple more meetings. So we go back to the residents. We heard you. This is how it's digested. Do that before, you know, as we go either um, right before or uh, around when we go to the transportation committee and then the one meeting that's really missing is coming back to the council. So um, that's kind of how we envision it. What we want is to engage with the community to help us identify priorities. I mean, we had a list of priorities before. Um, priorities change and we've accomplished a lot. We need to recognize the things that we've done. So back then we had maybe two, two routes when the plan was developed and now we have a lot more. So um, the one last comment that I'll have is I know it's a semantic issue, update, refresh, et cetera, but if we go back to the grand jury report and our grant application, the language that we used was up, that they used and we used was update. Yeah, public comment. A comment and, and, and question actually, because this is sort of an all time night for me, because I worked on that like master plan also 10 years ago. And I do think it would be really nice and, and informative for the community to say, hey, it's 10 years later. Here's how the bike lanes have improved safety. So how many like accidents have we had from bicyclists in this last 10 year period versus maybe the prior period. Here's, here are the changes that we made in the original plan. How is that, how have you enjoyed the bike lanes? Has that changed your bike habits? And, and what do you think is still needed? I think that's a really good way to show 
continuity and understanding and engage people in a kind of long-term iterative improvement process. I do know that Menlo Atherton High School, since that bike plan in 2014, implemented a whole slew of bike parking spots right on Middlefield and changed a lot of mm -hmm. availability in bikers. And mm -hmm. I, I, I know that I see many more bikers now on Middlefield than I did. And I think it's also improved traffic. So maybe there are some corresponding questions about reducing traffic because traffic is a big issue for many people who aren't bikers and they prefer to see bikers than more cars. So that might be another benefit that could be noted. But um, I, I, I think that this, that there should be, you know, you know, you're doing a survey about the tennis courts that serves maybe a hundred or plus people, but biking serves thousands and people not just in Atherton, but going through Atherton. So to be able to maybe capture some of that input somehow would be valuable to people using these routes. That would be my comment. Thank you. Rick has his hand up. Oh, sorry, Rick. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so uh, I think what Robert said is fine. Uh, I, I do think that there's value to having meetings in neighborhoods with people because I think that they go to them more often than they come to meetings here. I, but in response to Council Member Widmer's comments, I'm not trying to increase the cost of the consultants. So maybe those aren't meetings that the consultants would need to manage. In fact, during the housing process, uh, the city manager and the mayor organized a bunch of neighborhood meetings mm -hmm. that were very successful because a lot of people went to them and learned a lot more about what we were doing on housing than if we hadn't done those meetings. I'd be perfectly happy for the mayor and the, and the city manager to organize meetings in each of the neighborhoods and not utilize the, the costly consultants. But I think it's really important that we have neighborhood meetings because I think those are things that people go to when their neighborhood is impacted. And, and I, you know, this could come back to us and we can make a judgment of where we need to have them. I, I don't know that we need to have them in every little street that something is proposed to be done on in the new bike ped master plan. But I, but just given the experience we've had there, you know, I don't want neighbors to be surprised. I, I, I want the residents to be engaged on this issue. And um, so. I agree. Good point. I can call Trip on. Um, I think you're right. We should definitely be doing as much outreach as we can. Um, I to echo what Valerie said, bike pen affects not just Atherton residents. I use a lot of roads. I ride my bike all the time. I use roads that aren't in my neighborhood because I'm tra traveling on Middlefield to get other places. So I think having townwide correspondence and also having a survey or some public way for non-residents to provide feedback, it impacts our traffic. It impacts our climate emissions. It, it Having more bike pen more safety on the roads for people using alternative methods of transportation, because it's not just bikes, it's also strollers, it's wheelchairs, having bike, ped facilities affects everyone's mobility. So I think having some very open public ways for people to give feedback with maps and visuals and stuff like that would be very useful. So I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this. I think it's gonna be a really good exercise. The only one thing I want to add is when George and I went and met with the local schools, Menlo School in particular had a lot to say about bicycles. It was a hot button for them. So I hope that they're consulted as part of this and that their voice and their concerns come forward through this. They feel like their students are in danger. Yeah. yeah. No, they brought it up. No, out I of know. clear blue, it was a real yeah. hot button for them. Mm. Yeah. So I want to make sure that voice gets in here. So, yeah. I think well, also, it's a very busy. Valparaiso is impossible. Uh, it's very tight. The little bike lanes are like maybe yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a, foot, a foot wide. You know? <laughs> and, you know, and half of it's in Menlo Park and some of yeah. it's in us. Yep. So it's, it's yeah. 
And I would say I feel safer on Valparaiso than I do on most Atherton streets because we have that a bike lane there, yeah. even if it's a smaller one. So, you know, the whole town can use a, a well, reevaluation. I would also remind everyone mm -hmm. with bike yeah. lanes that it's kind of a field of dreams situation. If you build it, they will come. So I think it's great that we're going to get some data on current traffic patterns. But when you build bike lanes, people feel safe for riding their bikes. You see more bikers. So, you know, personally, my son's preschool is on Middle Avenue in Mammal Park. They just put bike lanes in front of it that are excellent. And now I ride my bike with my kid on it way more. And I know a lot of other parents in the school do that too. So building bike lanes can change patterns of traffic as well. So we need to be forward point. thinking in this. So I'd remind I just everybody that? about prize that was being and that one's re yeah, restriped. I, mean, I, I think that's shrunk. certainly true. I, the biggest, and but I don't think it matters whether it's a class two or a class three bike lane. Like just think about Atherton Avenue. We now, I, you and I drive Atherton Avenue all the time. We see so many more cyclists on Atherton Avenue since we've made it a shared mm -hmm. car bike. It, it, it's amazing how many more cyclists are on that road now than were before. Before I, I always saw a few cyclists on it, but now there's a lot. And I compare that to Alameda where there's a real defined bike lane where there's always been a lot of people. So I think if you build it, people will come and I, I'm not really sure there's a huge difference between two and three, class two and class three. Um, I'm not, I mean, it, people like Alameda, so there's probably some difference. There's a, yeah. Atherton Avenue has big giant trucks going down it. It gets yeah. pretty exciting. But there's still a lot, there's still a fair number of bikes. Yeah. I mean, maybe as many as Alameda, I don't know. The drivers would prefer to see a class, a class two because they get frustrated and sometimes drive somewhat dangerously with uh, when people are merging into the main driving area in a class three, which is, I mean, that's 100% there, right? I do it when I'm driving, and especially when I'm going to turn. But I know that um, some drivers become more aggressive at that time. So it's, it's better to have a two than a three. Um, a one is a little over the top, but uh, we'll see what Menlo Park does when they work with our people to redo Valparaiso, which w should help dramatically down on that street. So, Robert, did you get everything that we wanted from us in terms of feedback on your RFP? Yeah, it'd just be the blessing to release. Okay, so. A blessing to release it. I, I'll, we'll make some textural edits to it, um, but a motion that we should move forward with putting it out. Do you have a motion? That, I'd like to make a motion that Robert move forward with releasing the RFP with the minor changes that we've talked about uh, here at this meeting. Is there a second? A second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, let's move on to item 11, consideration of the Knox Play School Amendment. And she's been so patiently waiting. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. <laughs> oh, again. <laughs> um, uh, before you tonight is uh, consideration of an amendment with Knox Play School to um, extend the term of... Uh, the existing lease and an adjustment in the rate of um, the rental rate. Um, the agreement expired, the current lease term expires um, at the end of the year. And we're, um, the request is um, one year with two additional one year options. And so with your approval of the amendment, um, if you approve the three years, we won't have to come back every year. Um, Susan is here tonight and, um, she's proposed an incremental adjustment in the rental rate. We are currently set with a fixed rate of, um, I think it's $125 per student per month. And so the proposal is for the first year, raise it by $10 
per student per month. So it would go from 125 to 135. Year two, it would go from 135 to 145. And then in year three, from 135 to, I'm sorry, 145 to 155. Um, and then she's also requesting um, that she retain the 30 day um, uh, option to um, uh, opt out of the lease. And so with that, I'm able to answer any questions you have. Susan Knox from Knox Play Schools here as well. Go ahead. So uh, the numbers of students that you've listed here in, in this uh, staff report, um, how do they compare to pre-COVID? Do you mind? They're much lower. Um, so I think I mentioned last year that we made a lot of changes in the program for COVID going from <clears throat> having a two-day week program or three-day week program. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so we had, numbers-wise, we had a lot more kids, over 100. Um, and now we have, I think, 46 we have signed up for next year um, in three different classes, but they come every day. So it's, it's kind of a different program. It's like, it's not comparing apples to apples. Okay, so that in, at any one period of time when you were paying $82,000, fixed fee every year um, 82 had, for the year yeah okay yeah for the year uh you were you had 100 students over 100 probably 120 and did you have a summer school program as well mm -hmm. okay all right and uh so with this reduced lip rate and as far as i'm concerned it looks reasonable thank you i have a question go for it. um would it be helpful for your school to have a longer lease? Like, I know you've initiated this, but I think from, I'm on the board of my son's preschool mm -hmm. and having lease um, uncertainty can make yeah. it difficult for planning. Mm -hmm. I think all that. I think we used to have a long lease when there was a larger capital investment. I think if I were to do that, I would want to request some like new floors and, you know, things like that. I would want to make some changes to the, because it's getting pretty old. So, I mean, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, and we could talk about that, sure. Okay. Well, talk to Robert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I did want to um, make a note that the current 30-day notice is a one-way, and so um, it's up to you to consider that one-way versus um, whether we wanted it two way or just leave hours as we approach the end of each I year. I have a question about Wait. that. Why, why would you continue to want that, uh, 30 days? That's a good day? question. I mean, yeah, I think with COVID obviously, yeah. it was, you know, so I much think maybe that would just be a personal thing. If something happened to me and I wasn't able to go, you know, yeah. I mean, um, I, I'm really the, the owner and the, I run it and, um, I mean, I really at six months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's only a year lease. Yeah, I mean, so. I I honestly don't see any circumstances that that would happen. Would I you would feel okay by taking that out. Yeah, I would probably, if anything happened, I would for sure try to finish out the year with the kids and the family. It's only a year's lease. Yeah, and I think it's beneficial for you. I don't know. It, That's fine. It, it, uh, from hearing you over the years, <clears throat> you've kind of felt like a one-year lease is kind of your horizon because you want yeah. a certain well I the first time we had a 10 year when I built that building. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there was a 10 year or there was a five year and then a five year option because I, I bought that second building. So Got it. Okay. that was a yeah. big investment. That was some time ago. Yes. <laughs> so um I don't have a problem with you having a 30 day things could happen. I mean, the COVID could come back and your enrollment goes down substantially and you think to call it quits. I don't think it's fair to put it on our side because then you have issues with the parents who put their kids in your camp and, and now suddenly they have to find something else. And, and I don't know what kind of contract you have with them, but they could come back and ask for some remuneration. So I, I think giving you as much flexibility as possible because you know COVID is starting to come back 
um, although it's not the same exact COVID. Hopefully it won't be as bad, but I think giving you flexibility is, is fine. You've been a good uh, uh, renter here and um, many people that I've talked to recently sent their kids to your school and are very positive about it. Um, but I don't think that after consideration, I don't think it's fair for us to have a 30 day uh, as was stated in here and George and I talked about because um, that can leave you holding the bag. So anyway, so I thank you. I think that what you've put together is fair. I uh, would rather have been a little bit higher, but of course I always would have done that. Um, but I, I'd like to, if there's nothing else, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this. Did you want no, to it's okay. I'll second it. Okay. 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 All, All in favor? favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. We have no report. Does anybody have any reports? I didn't do anything. I will. You didn't report. do anything? I, d I didn't report anything out. <laughs> oh. You're going to make it an eight o'clock day. I will. Can I, I said. report something out? Because I was at the fire board meeting <laughs> last night, and the topic was on the agenda was how will Atherton becoming a charter city affect the fire district? And a resident got up and talked about how Atherton was not doing our share and that we were trying to avoid meet, meeting our Reno things. And they tried to somehow spin that into being that's going to affect the fire department in terms of their response times. I don't quite make that connection. But um, what ended up coming out of it is that the fire board requested who I think was their attorney to come up with a, um, just a report for them, a brief on what the implications for the fire district is if we become a charter city. So I wanted you guys to know that that was put on the table. The other thing that came up that was interesting is there was a whole discussion about the fire and how they were gonna support um, community groups in terms of emergency response, groups like um, MPC Ready and, and ADAPT. And the subcommittee had voted not to fund the, the um, and they didn't agree. So it was very contentious in terms of half of the people felt that they should be funding the community groups. The other half didn't, it brought up a lot of, so it was a bit of, it was a bit flamey, but at the end it didn't pass. So that will, we'll hear that again. But um, so I just wanted you guys to know about that. Cause I thought, you know, we were front and center on their whole meeting with two items, which never happened. So right. anyway, anybody else have anything what to was share? the resident? that made the comment a resident whose first name was Peter? It was a woman and I only saw the back of her head because I was attending on Zoom. And their their acoustics are as bad as ours. I so it, oh, okay. it was, yeah. They can't be as bad as ours. <laughs> so anyway, if and no one else- Virginia, Virginia didn't want to fund our ADAPT is what you said. That's correct. So we should well, know who our friends are. Well, all right. Okay, let's not get names. Really anyway, that. I want to- Okay, motion to adjourn. Motion, yes. Oh boy. All right, we're done. Right. Thank you. Aye, thank you. Bye. I know. Well, Try hard. <laughs> well, it feels like, hey, yeah, yeah, approve the preschool. I want to get friend. out of here. You did a lot of talking, my friend.